In this country, in 15 or 20 years' time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. Well, I can already hear the chorus of execration. <coughs> How dare I say such a horrible thing? How dare I stir up trouble and inflame feelings by repeating such a conversation? My answer is that I do not have the right not to do so. <coughs> Those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. We must be mad, literally mad as a nation, to be permitting the annual inflow of some 50,000 dependents who are for the most part the material of the future growth of the immigrant descended population. It is like watching, watching a nation busily engaged in heaping up its own funeral pyre. Disturbed by the speed and scale of change, Powell quoted government statistics which predicted, quite accurately as it turned out, that by the year 2000 there would be between five and seven million immigrants, accounting for one-tenth of Britain's population. The unique culture and civilization of Powell's beloved country were being transformed against his wishes by mass migration. It almost passes belief that at this moment, 20 to 30 additional immigrant children are arriving from overseas in Wolverhampton alone every week and that means 15 or 20 additional families a decade or so hence we feel we're being outnumbered and the policy of this country now is to integrate well if they the colored people are going to be allowed to form communities how can integration take place The British people had never been consulted on the unprecedented transformation taking place in their country. The speed and scale of immigration made many feel uneasy. Familiar neighborhoods were being changed forever. Some white British people also believed they were becoming second-class citizens in their own country. Much of Powell's speech was not recorded. The following extract is read by an actor. They found their wives unable to obtain hospital beds in childbirth, their children unable to obtain school places, their homes and neighborhoods changed beyond recognition. They began to hear, as time went by, more and more voices which told them that they were now the unwanted. I walked the streets with my wife and three children. We had nowhere to go. We spent a week at her mother's, a week at her sister's. Nowhere at all to go. And uh, eventually we found a place, a very dilapidated place. We're still living. Uh, it's 100 years old. The roof leaks. It's, uh, it's uh, no good in this day and age for people are living. And uh, when I look out of, the, out of my back window, there's blocks of flats and masonettes with black people in. I think that's wrong. I think that the ex-servicemen should get preference in this country and preference these people. Powell believed that the discrimination his countrymen complained of was about to be made far worse by new legislation which the Labour government was proposing. I can't let you in. Um, I've got uh, 14 English boys in here. 14 English boys? Yeah. So you don't want to... Um, I, can't, I can't mix. I'm ever so sorry. I wouldn't sell it, but if I let you come in, all my boys would yeah. leave. A new race relations bill would make it illegal to refuse housing, employment or public services to people because of their ethnic background. The legislation was meant to stop the victimization of immigrants, but Powell believed it would result in the victimization of whites instead. 
the discrimination and the deprivation, the sense of alarm and of resentment lie not with the immigrant population, but with those among whom they have come and are still coming. This is why to enact legislation of the kind before Parliament at this moment is to risk throwing a match onto gunpowder. There could be no grosser misconception of the realities than is entertained by those who vociferously demand legislation, as they call it, against discrimination. Whether they be leader writers of the same kidney and sometimes on the very same newspapers as those which year after year in the 1930s tried to blind this country to the rising peril which confronted it, or archbishops who live in palaces faring delicately with the bedclothes pulled right up over their heads. <laughs> That sense of an impending danger being ignored was highlighted in an incendiary letter Powell claimed to have received concerning a constituent from Wolverhampton, an elderly widow. The letter alleged that she'd been repeatedly intimidated by black immigrants who had moved into her street. Enoch Powell always chose his words with calculated precision. Now he took the greatest gamble of his political career in using language about the widow that no senior politician has dared publicly use before or since. No recording of this section of the speech exists, but these are the words that Powell quoted. She is becoming afraid to go out. Windows are broken. She finds excreta pushed through her letterbox. When she goes to the shops, she is followed by children. Charming, wide grinning, pickaninnies. Here is their means of showing that the immigrant communities can organize to consolidate their members, to agitate and campaign against their fellow citizens, and to overawe and dominate the rest. In these circumstances, nothing will suffice but that the total inflow for settlement should be reduced at once to negligible proportions and that the necessary legislative and administrative measures should be taken without delay. Powell ended his speech with a line from the Roman poet Virgil which summed up his deep sense of anxiety. It is one of the most misquoted lines in British political history. As I look ahead, I am filled with foreboding. Like the Roman, I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood.